Mel Robbins event. So let's talk about sex. The secret men keep. Oh, really? Today on Mel. I'm Mel Robbins, and I'm a life coach who's helped millions of people get the life they deserve. It's about small steps and big breakthroughs. I believe in you. And together, yes, we got this. I love you too. I am so excited for today's show. Oh my God. I'm Mel Robbins. Welcome to the show. Now, there's something a little different about today's show. I have an entire audience filled with just men. That's right. Oh God. You know, I thought it would be really cool if I was the only woman in the room and I got a chance to understand what are men really thinking? What are they feeling? And why the hell don't they share it with me, or you, or us, right? That's why I wanted to do the show today. It's for men, it's with men, it's about men, and we're gonna talk about the things that men don't like to talk about. My wife and I have been together for seven years and married for three. Hassan and I met in our early 30s and then married in our late 30s. And now we have a three-year-old daughter. I work part-time as a delivery guy. I work nine to five as a senior bank auditor, and I'm the primary breadwinner. Tamika picks up the slack with the bills as I work on my passion projects. I pay the medical bills, the credit card bills, even Hassan's parking tickets. It takes a toll on my self-esteem. I feel the pressure now, having a daughter at three. So now the choices I make when I'm out there chasing my dream it has to be about all of us instead of just me. I feel like it's my job to show my daughter what a man's supposed to do for his family. So thank you for being here. And I want to start with the last thing that you said. Yes. What a man is supposed to do for his family. Yes. So describe what a man is supposed to do for his family in your words. In my words, a man is supposed to take care of his family. Like if I have a little daughter, I'm supposed to show her this is what a man is supposed to do. Provide for the wife, work, and make sure they're okay. And so when you say provide, you mean be the one that makes the money? Financially, yes. Okay. And who makes more money in your relationship right now? I do. She do. This, this is also my story, and we'll, I'll share more about that. This happened in my marriage, too. Okay. But what is it like for you emotionally to wrestle with those feelings that you, you have the idea of providing with making money, and when you're not making money, what does it make you feel about yourself? It creates uh, me and her not connecting like we communication mm -hmm. my communication knowing that okay she makes more money um it's like for instance communicating with her like bills okay like um is that know, like going into a war zone hassan seems to think that the bills will evaporate into thin air <laughs> <laughs> he does <laughs> he thinks that <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know I'll, I'll see them come in, but I'll say, you know, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to throw them in his face and say, hey, what about this? You know, but then I'll see second notice, final notice, and then I have to say, hey, what are we going to do about this? You know, are we going to take care of this? Are you going to take care of this? You know, so I think that a lot of men equate money as being, you know, empowered, being the man of the house. But for me you know, he is the man of the house. And I mm. give him that power in our household. I just happen to make more money. Well, you know why I think this is such a charged issue for men? This is just my opinion, is that society puts a tremendous amount of pressure on women in terms of how we look. Right. And whether or not we're good daughters and good partners, right? right. And for men, what I've seen, at least with the men in my life, is that they feel the equivalent pressure around success and how much money you make. Absolutely. And so what I wonder is, do you not pay, do, do you see some bill that you can't quite pay? And the reason you don't tell her is because it brings up all this garbage inside of you about the fact that you're not where you wanted to be in your life financially? Of course. I don't even check the mail. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know this, it's not no check in there. 
<laughs> so back to what you said, where, where, where does this hit me emotionally? I'm yeah. like, you know what? I didn't get a lot of gigs this week. You know, mm. working the clubs, I'm selling my little DVDs. I know something in it, because some men could tell what a male, what a bill look like. It don't say pay to the order of. Right. So I would take the mail and just put it to the side, knowing if she do it, she's going to say, what's this? Like she just said, she's going to open the bill. So there's a lot of mail that I should, I should open and, and tell her. So that's where the communication is off, where I'm emotionally like, I know what she's going to say. I should have paid for it. And as a man, I don't want to keep hearing that. The real issue is that it is, for a man, it's embarrassing and it feels almost like the bigger, heavier word is shameful that I have to go to my wife because that's not what society tells you you're supposed to do. Correct. Right? And then for you, what does it bring up for you? You know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's a balancing act with me being, you know, understanding of his feelings because it's real. You know, it's not really easy. And I understand that, you know, it's not easy for a man in this day and age to, you know, feel like they have to submit or they feel like they're making less than the woman in their life. So well, I what I like also I found is it, it seems really cool to be the stay-at-home dad mm -hmm. until you're the only dude in the pickup line at the preschool. Right. Right? And then you're like, what am I doing here? I have to or accept when, that. Or when they know his name. That you're a stay-at-home dad. And sometimes they know his name a lot more than they know my name. And how does that make you feel? I, I, sometimes I do feel awful. You know, I feel awful when I go to pick, we have to sign in to pick her up and drop her off. And his signature is there most of the time, you know, as the person that she sees picking her up and dropping her off to school. We call day. that in our household the point parent. And that's the first name on the emergency call right. list. And it's the right. person that's more likely to be able to pick up the phone. Right. And be able to go. Right. Um, you know, the other reason why I want to talk about this is because f did you know that 40% of the women working are the primary breadwinners in their households? I had no idea. And 40? this dynamic is very real in a relationship. And it's, it's, it's particularly charged for men. And so I want to bring in motivational speaker and best-selling author of The Truth About Men, Devon Franklin. Wow. Yes. Before we go to break, why do you think so many men struggle with self-esteem when it comes to issues related to money? You know, I think the issue is a lot of times the money, especially when your partner is making more than you, sometimes it's a reflection of your own insecurity. Mm. Because of all the things you're talking about, it's like, oh, as a man, I'm supposed to. Well, there's a box that we're taught to live in, and when we don't live in the box, it breaks us. So Hassan is expressing that brokenness, that, oh, if I don't, I'm not the breadwinner, then that means I'm not a real man. But the reality is this, that too often we're placing our value on what we do instead of who we are. She married you because of who you are, and she loves you. Let me tell you, when I got married, my wife made more money than me. Mm. Did I, was I insecure <laughs> about that? I said, no. I said, thank you, Lord. I appreciate <laughs> you. <laughs> about it because here's why here's why to become one so it's what anything that we deny we empower to destroy us so when you're not looking at the bills you're allowing those bills to disrupt your marriage so so often when we have a problem with the breadwinner and the wife having the money it's because we're looking at it as us versus them mm -hmm. no it's we so if she's got money i got money i'm gonna put some money in and she's gonna put some money in but here's the thing and you you alluded to it mel provision has to be more than just financial there are a lot of men that provide financially for their families, but they're absent. They don't love. They, they aren't there relationally. And the kids, yeah, thank you, yeah. And, and, and the kids and the wife go uh, unnourished. So provision has to be a 360. You may not be making the money, but you can still be present. You can still show up. And also, continue to champion her. Because she's being rewarded in, in, her, in her life yeah. and she's doing great, say, baby, I'm your cheerleader. And guess what? Man, you have so much material to, to, to do comedy. You should be doing comedy about this very thing. Yo, yo, I don't even like look at the bills. Man, you got material. <laughs> That's what you should so do. Much material. On, man. So true. And uh, we're going to go a little deeper and actually get the audience involved when we come back. Stay with us. <laughs> Up next. Joining me is the love of my life, my husband, Christopher Robbins. When my career started to go, you felt a lot of the same things. Yeah, just soul crushing. Wow. <laughs> and later, what don't men tell their partners about sex? Anything that you don't want to tell me? 
Yes. <laughs> filled with men, and we're talking about some of the top things that men don't like to talk about with their partners. I'm here with Tamika and her husband, Hassan. She makes more money, and that has a negative impact on his self-esteem as he builds his comedy career. Now, I know a lot about this because this dynamic happened in my marriage. And joining me is the love of my life, my husband, Christopher Robbins. of a men's retreat called Soul Degree and best-selling author Devon Franklin. Yes. So, Devon, I want to start with you. And can you talk a little bit more about this connection mm -hmm. between the shame that men feel and the, the pressure to, to provide financially? What happens is we outsource our value. When we look in the mirror and we don't th see value, we then try to find value in what we do and what we earn. So, so often, instead of men looking in the mirror and saying, you know what, I like who I am as a man. So often we focus on doing and not being. Uh, so often with men, we're talking about, oh, being tough versus being enough. So I think a lot of times we as men struggle in this area because we are conditioned to find our value in what we do. Very rarely do we find it in just being. Amazing. I have a question. How many of you in the audience can relate to the pressure that Hassan feels? The pressure to earn money, the pressure to provide. Raise your hands higher, damn it. Let me see him. Yeah, okay. See, you're not alone in this. And I know, Chris, when my career started to go, you felt a lot of the same things. And so can you share a little bit with him about how that situation impacted you at the time? Mm. Yeah, just soul crushing. Um, Wow, and and I say <laughs> it, it, it really was, and 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 it's not so much the society or the societal effect. I think for myself, the the role model I had was my father, mm. and my father grew up and went from mailroom to you know president and did what often society thinks or sees, like they're bringing home the bacon. And that was the only paradigm that I had to live in. And so, it, it, and it wasn't even so much dollar signs, or but talk about not having a roadmap of just how to be you. Yeah. Um, I, I was only living inside of, well, this is what I'm supposed to do because I watched as a kid what my father did. Yeah. When this took off for you and I, um, I struggled for five or six years mm -hmm. being the guy in the bus line or, looking at my watch two o'clock on a Tuesday and here I was in the doctor's office with the kids thinking, what the hell am I doing? I'm a complete failure here. Mm. Mm. Um, and I struggled with that a lot until I actually had a conversation with my own children about how that was seemingly killing me and I wasn't looking in the mirror saying, you know, you're just being an awesome dad. This and is the killer part, like this is the piece. So, and, and here's the other thing is that I don't think it, I, I, I go overboard affirming Chris. There's no chance in hell I would right. be doing this without him and without his support. And our marriage is the most important thing to me. And as his partner, I want him to be happy. But I'll tell you the greatest gift, the greatest gift is, as his dad was climbing the ladder, he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And our kids and your daughter have something that so many kids do not have the chance to have, which is a super tight bond with a dad who is present. And that is worth more money than you could ever make. So, Devon, what is your advice for couples like Hassan and Tamika? Um, you know, my advice is, uh, one, you know, first of all, appreciate each other, love each other, uh, be in each other's corner, cheer each other on. Uh, two, you know, Hassan and men like Hassan, you got to look in the mirror. We got to rebuild your esteem. You gotta, how do you do that? Here's how you do it. You got to talk to yourself better than the way you have talked to yourself. Because as men, we are our number one critics. So we have to change the negative self-talk. And we have to find affirmations in the things that we do positive. You're in the doctor's office at two o'clock. Hey, I'm here. I'm present. 
that's powerful. So to build, rebuild the esteem, it's about, hey, I gotta change the tapes that I keep replaying over and over again. The other thing is that you gotta say, hey, you know what? I got love. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. And you got it. You got it. That's right. The other thing that's super cool is the more that Chris has figured that out and supported me and been this amazing parent, the more successful she will come and the more successful you'll be. And so Chuck Nice, uh, what advice do you have for him in terms of building his career while he's feeling the weight of this? Um, be grateful, man. Um, you have somebody who's supporting you as you're building your career, uh, which is just phenomenal to have a support system there. And uh, just believe that at some point, you're going to be able to repay her tenfold. Mm. And by the way, it's not repayment, that's your wife, right. okay? You guys are in this together. So when I first came to New York City, my wife was taking care of me. I do not tell this often, but I will say it right here and right now. She took care of me, and on top of that, she was pregnant. Mm. Now, can you imagine that you were watching your wife go to work, work all day, come home pregnant, and then you know what she would do? She would say, yo, let's go. We got to get out to the comedy club because mm -hmm. that's why we came here nice. for you to go do comedy. This woman's pregnant. Mm -hmm. So, and all I can tell you is, uh, you know, things aren't that way now. Uh, as a matter of fact, things started working for me and she hasn't worked since. Mm -hmm. And now right. I'm like, please get a job. <laughs> <laughs> You are hilarious. That's why we, we have you here, my friend. The second biggest silent battle men are waging, men and why they feel like they no longer have friends. We'll be right back. Coming up next. What does it feel like to talk about something that you've been keeping a secret? And later. Here's the truth that most men deal with but they never express. That no matter how much they love a woman, it doesn't stop the lustful thoughts. I'm just gonna say this, my wife is watching and so, <laughs> yes it does. <laughs> hey, I'm Mel Robbins. Today my entire studio audience is filled with men and we're talking about the things that men don't like to talk about and what they don't tell their partners. Now we just discussed money and the pressure to succeed and now we are talking about something that really surprised me when I was preparing for this show. And it's the secrets men keep about adult friendships. My name is Tommy and I'm 38 years old. My secret is I have no friends. The only people I have in my life are acquaintances or my wife's friends. As a man, I'm supposed to push my feelings down and not let anyone know what's bothering me. Feeling like I want friends, it's hard to admit. The loneliness, it takes a toll on me. Thinking about why things the way they are, it's exhausting. My biggest fear is that as I get older, it's gonna become harder and harder to make friends and I'm just gonna end up old and alone. So I'm back with best-selling author Devon Franklin and comedian Chuck Nice. Chuck, I saw you nodding and even saying this is common. Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, intimacy is what friendship really is. And it's very difficult now for men to feel comfortable admitting the fact that we need intimacy mm. in order to thrive. And all I'm gonna say to you, Tommy, is I will be your friend, man. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a lousy friend. <laughs> I need you to be my friend because sometimes I need somebody to bail me out of jail. And then... <laughs> you didn't know that we were going to go straight there, right, Todd? No. So okay. what does it feel yeah. like to talk about something, though, that's sort of you've been keeping a secret about? It's been a journey. Um, like, logically, I know I should have friends, um, but there just seems to be this emotional block uh, when it comes to pursuing friendship and maintaining friendship. Um, Has this always been the case? No, uh, I was president of my fraternity back in college. Uh, I had a lot of friends, we hung out, kind of lost touch. I moved to LA and 
Oh, well, that explains it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Kind of lost touch with them. I only speak to two now, um, and one of them, it's he calls me every three months, and I we probably wouldn't be friends if it weren't for him. Uh, so there's just this emotional block, this um, limiting belief, sort of like uh, that I don't understand. Is huh. happening. Yeah. If you did understand what it was, do you have any idea where it might come from? It may have been, uh, you know, sort of not to make it sound traumatic, but just the the transition from. Texas life to California, LA life, uh, and but outside of that, I nothing's coming. It's just uh, there's this again this emotional block, and it's just and it, the the funny thing is like I'm not always like this. You know, when if I I have my wife and we're in a social situation, we're almost like a power couple where we have conversations. So I, I'm not the shy, quiet type. I'm I'm there and right. present. Right. Right. Um, but then nothing ever comes as a result of it. Like, where I'm not talking to those people outside of that. So are they her friends too? Yeah, yeah, they're her friends, um, pretty much. All, they're all acquaintances and we're not having beers and you know having conversations independent of that. Um, we're just, I only see them when, uh, when I'm with her. So, you know, I think as women, I know I'm certainly guilty of this, we're like tornadoes and we take over and then we make you guys kind of fit in. And there's also that dynamic where there may be other couples where you like the dude, but I can't stand the chick right. or vice versa. Sure. Right. Yeah. So what, what are you hearing in this? Yeah. You know, I'm hearing. I mean, first of all, I think it's, it's very common. You know, I completely agree that this is something that most men deal with, because a lot of times as men, again, we're taught to fear intimacy. And in order to have friends, we have to be a good friend. It's very easy. Most of the time growing up, these our male friendships are casual. They're surface. Hey, let's go watch the game. Let's go play ball. But then what happens, and I've been married for seven years, and I've noticed this too. It's like if I don't pursue these friendships, right. they don't, they, they're, not, they're, they're not just there. Like, you know, with my wife, it's very easy. Hey, I'm going to hang out with my girlfriends. And then I sit back and say, well, how many, wh who are my guys? <laughs> right. And I realize yeah. that I have to nurture it. I have to work at it because so often we have to be the change that we want to see. And part of that is saying, all right, the friends you meet at the party, okay, give, give me your number. Let's go hang out. Let me follow up and pursue it in order for it to manifest. Well, you know what else I think about, guys, is I think about this. I think about, I'm thinking about my own son, right, or our, our son. And that is that there's so much organized activities for them. So whether it's like the Boy Scouts or Pop Warner football, mm -hmm. or then it's like a team in middle school, and then it's a team in high school, and then you got your fraternity, and then all of a sudden you're in adulthood, and your friends are the people you work with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so also there's so much structure when you're little that has you bumping into people mm -hmm. that you're also not trained to develop it. But also it's structure without any depth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can How many on... of you relate to this? What are you saying? Uh, we can okay. Be... All right, let's talk to them. Let's talk to them. All right. Yes, sir, what's your name? My, uh, John. Hi, John. So I had this experience. I was married for a very long time and I had always been just connected to my wife or my girlfriend prior to that. And so women maintain their friendships, men don't. They go with their partner. And I had an experience in my life where I decided that I needed to create my own space. And so I joined a rowing team and I had rowed in college and it had been 20 years. And I went back and I met these amazing group of guys <clears throat> and I, they're fantastic friends even to this day. It's been many years and you nurture them. But I think the problem is that you tend to go with the woman in your life and mm. you sacrifice your own time. You need to carve out your own time. Yes. And, and so it's, they say that relationships are you, me, and us. And a lot of times the men sacrifice the me part of it sure. for the relationship and women don't tend to do that. So carve out your own time, go find a hobby and you'll meet friends there. But you need to pull away from your relationship. What's your response? Yeah, I, I agree, but I also agree. I think that's that's totally right. But I also feel like part of the issue is um, the move kind of mess up your yeah. your esteem. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like if, well, if I don't feel worthy of friendship, then I'm gonna I'm not gonna pursue it. And the other thing is too that you know you have uh, we as men when you're married, you have a tendency to make your wife's relationships your surrogate relationships. Mm. And what that does is it excuses you from the real work that has to be done for friendship. That's right. Okay. <laughs> because what you can do is you can have all the trappings of friendship but not have to do any of the hard stuff that comes along with friendship. You know, I have, a, I have several friends here 
uh, that are my relationships that happened after I moved from Philadelphia, and we're extremely close, and it takes a great deal of friendship is a garden. That's all there is to it. It takes a great deal of cultivation and nurturing. And my wife calls my buddies my girlfriends, (laughs) because that's how much, that's how tight we are, and that's how much time we spend together. You know what I mean? And I say I love you to them on the phone. You know, and I'm like, I love you, Carlos. And he's like, love you too, Papa. And I'm just, and you know, and and she's like, I love that. I love that. Oh, that was your girlfriend. And I'm just like, yes, as a matter of fact. And you better make sure that you stay cuter than Carlos forever. Awesome. Well, when we come back, the final silent battle men are waging against themselves. We're going to meet another man who's confessing a secret when we come back. Next, why is it so critical for men to start to take this seriously? And later, what don't men tell their partners about sex? Anything that you don't want to tell me? (laughs) Yes! Oh, really? Today, six million men in America are diagnosed with depression every year. And men are less likely than women to seek treatment, which means the actual number is way higher. Anxiety is on the rise, stress is on the rise, and men are suffering in silence. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the suicide rate among American men is four times higher than among women. Men continue to keep how they feel a secret, and it weighs heavily on them. Today, the entire studio audience is filled with men, and we're talking about the things men don't tell their partners and they don't like to discuss. My next guest is revealing a secret that affects six million men every year in this country. My name is Michael, and I'm 51 years old. I suffer from depression. My life often feels hopeless. Now that I'm 51 and decided not to get married or have children, I feel like my life has hit rock bottom. I'm about to file bankruptcy, and I have no one to turn to for help. So, Michael, Hmm? what is it like to share this? It's difficult. I mean, it's not something you can talk to everybody about. Um, You know, I I have friends and family that I don't want to burden. Um, And it's it's difficult. I try to battle it myself. Do you know or can you pinpoint when you realize that this might be depression? 2017, I was working for a bank, and they were privately mutually funded, and they went public. So my job was eliminated, and the kind of the downturn started then, trying to find a job. So I started doing Uber, and I started doing Lyft for the networking to meet people, uh, executives, things like that at the airport. And quite simply, that does not work. When somebody gets into an Uber or Lyft, they don't want to talk. They want their quiet time, be on the phone iPad, phone, whatever it is. And so that didn't work. So I basically you know, looked at other options, pizzeria, delivery, and I work at a local police department, which, which that really th- uh, drives me because it gives me a little bit of purpose. And so what did you start to feel that made you think that you may be suffering from depression? Hopelessness, um, not wanting to be out with people, uh, not seeing the bright, the, the, the happiness in the world, you don't feel. You're numb. So, Dr. Russell, what are you hearing? I actually hear some very positive things here because you have figured out, sort of sounds like on your own, a couple of the major pieces of advice that I would have given you. What are they? Which would be, as hard as it is for us guys to do, you have to express what you need so that people don't have to be minded. It's amazing what people will do for us to help us get our needs met if they know. If we don't express that we need some conversation, we need some validation, then there could be a a, a misimpression that people could have that we don't want it, that we sort of like to be isolated. We're kind of introverted in that they're actually giving us what we want by kind of hanging back. Then the second thing is, I always tell, no matter what it is that's causing someone to not be happy with their lives, I often say there is a world of good to do out there. And if you get involved and do some of that, it will do a world of good for you. And you've done that with the police department. Because when you 
find a community, a group that's out there doing something good, something that's meaningful to you, that you think is important, and you get out there, they're going to welcome you right. because it's an all hands on deck kind of they situation. Have. And you're going to meet people. And not only are you going to meet people, but you're going to have at least one common interest, belief, value with those people. You're gonna start working on stuff with them and you're gonna have some common experiences. You're gonna help each other out. Those are all the building blocks of relationships. And the other thing that's gonna happen is when you're doing something that you feel is meaningful and you get happier as a result of that, there'll be more of a magnetic attraction to other, of other people to you. So Dr. Russell, Michael is in therapy, which is awesome, but why is it so critical for men to start to take this seriously? Just like you go to the gym and you work your muscles and you build that kind of physical strength, why is it important for men in particular to be building this mental strength? Well, that's a great question. Because men take longer to seek out help, if they ever do, it's a shame the amount of time that gets wasted. Mm. That, that they're not getting better. And, and, when, and if they finally do, and I'm, I'm so glad to hear, as I said, there, there's, there's so much positive I hear in your story in addition to the negative parts. <laughs> many guys, many guys who've been through what you went through would have taken much longer than you've taken. And you could look back and say, well, it's a couple years that, on the, of this journey, but my gosh, I've seen people who wasted 10 years, 20 years. And so we I see I him love, on the show every day. I love what you're doing because you're it's entire chunks of people's lives that we're saving in terms of giving them some quality of life out of it. Well, here's what I want to say, because you said time and in your video, you said you're facing bankruptcy. You're 51. Here's what I want you to do, because I think you look ahead and see the end. I want you to look ahead and realize you have a whole nother 50 years. <laughs> this is a new chapter and you're not starting from scratch. You're starting with experience. And even the experience of bankruptcy is incredible experience. Let me read you the list of some of the people that you may not know who went bankrupt. Walt Disney, Henry Ford, Dave Ramsey, and Thomas Jefferson. So I want you to start to work right now on how you look out at the future and realize you have a hell of a lot of time to live and you should start working hard and fighting to make it something amazing. You got it? All right, when we come back, what men don't want to tell us about sex. Stay with us. Coming up. When a woman is mad at you and she doesn't tell you, what she is really saying is figure out why I am mad and then fix that problem so that I will know that you do not mind that I am crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Mel Robbins. My entire studio audience is filled with men talking about what they don't like to tell their partners. I'm also joined by Devon Franklin, Chuck Nice, and Dr. Brian Russell. So let's talk, yeah, so let's talk about sex. So I've got the same question for all of you, and it's just what don't men tell their partners about sex? Devon. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, a lot. <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> um, I believe that every man, all of us, struggle between two things, love and lust. Uh, love of ourselves, love of the woman in our life, love of God, love of family, love of community. Uh, but lust, lust is more than just a sexual desire. It's a, you know, selfish fulfillment, wanting what we want when we want it, however we, we want it. And here's the truth that most men deal with, but they never express, that no matter how much they love a woman, it doesn't stop the lustful thoughts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop the lustful feelings. That's right. where the truth uh, is. Okay, me. so Dr. I'm, I'm just going to say this. My wife is watching, and so, <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> no lustful thoughts, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Russell. What don't we tell or your don't partners we... about sex that you're thinking that you don't want us to know? Anything that might disappoint you. 
and anything that might elicit disappointment to us. In other words, anything that might result in feedback to us other than you're the greatest, best, <laughs> most amazing thing I have ever experienced. Wow. I feel like I should uh, ask Chris, is there anything <laughs> that you... <laughs> Over here. Anything? Anything that you don't want to tell me? No pressure. Um, <laughs> it's always better in the morning. Yes. Oh, really? Anyone else? That was a good tip. All right, anyone else have a secret to reveal? Yes. Sometimes if it's just too happy, you got to think about baseball, you know, like, yeah. So you, gotta, you think about something else if it's not? You have no idea how many times I've been just replaying just music videos in my head. Just and get that. Let me just say this. That yes. is coming from the youngest guy in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Every other man in this room is like, I do not have that problem. <laughs> Okay, as a matter of fact, I'm trying, I'm trying to think about how am I going to end this? <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? Who else? Come on, gentlemen. Naughty corner. Naughty, Naughty, Naughty corner. corner. Okay. Yes, Jay. Come on, stand up. What's your name? Cornell. Okay. And so, like, you know how you be scrolling through your Instagram and all you see is lustful bodies? It's like, yeah. it's hard not to double tap it, you know? And that's considered cheating, so. Uh, is that, is that, is that, that's a lustful thought with a tap. Yeah. Is well, that cheating, Devon? You know what? Here's the thing. If you're in a relationship you're in your, or you're married and you're scrolling through Instagram, you have to ask the question, is the heart you're getting ready to like worth losing the heart you already have? Oh. You can scroll and keep going. That's right. Acknowledge, yep, that's a fine woman, but I, right. I love who I got. Keep yeah. scrolling. Because yep. is it worth producing insecurity right. in her by hitting the, the, the light? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, you, you can't stop yourself from having that feeling. It's there, but you can control how you manage it. And aside from that, just know this. The double tap is the only tap that you will be getting. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, we're flipping the script, and you don't want to miss it. Stay with us. is filled with men talking about what men don't like to talk to their partners about. And now I'm here with comedian Chuck Nice, and we are giving the audience an opportunity yeah. to ask us some questions. So, who's first? I think we're going to go with Stephen okay, first. Okay, Stephen, come on, let's yeah. go over. What's your question? Right. So my question is, how come women could hold it together with everybody else but when it comes to the men in their life, they have such a short fuse. Oh, uh, that, that, I'll go first. That's a very okay. Good, go ahead. Uh, well, if I had a short fuse with my boss, I'd be fired. <laughs> and if I had it with my friends, I wouldn't have any. So I save it for you because you're not going anywhere. That, right? That's an excellent. That's an excellent answer. Uh, quite frankly, it's so good. I'm just going to skip and ask you a question about hair care. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you though the truth. The truth is, is that if you were to do anything to improve your relationship, it's working on your tone and how you save the worst for the best person. And that is one thing that I work very, very hard on. And I will also work uh, better at the mornings, Chris. There we go. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> but you'll have to, you won't have to work as hard if you work better in the mornings. You won't have true. to work as hard. That's true. That's true. All right. Where's Stefan? Yeah, right oh, okay, here. great. So what's your question? How come women can't decide where they want to eat? <laughs> wow. Well, you know what? I, I'm going to be honest. I used to struggle with this with my wife because, and then I realized because she didn't want to hear me complain about the place that she picked, she would always say, no, you pick the place because that way when I said, you know what, that wasn't that good. She'd be like, well, that's your fault. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I think that I, I, we're complicated because we think about how the food we're going to eat is going to impact whether we're bloated and whether or not we have to unbutton our pants or how we feel. And so we go back and forth. I don't know. But I, th I like your answer better. All right. Lewis. Here he goes. Okay, Lewis, what's your question? 
when you're very angry about something and you don't tell us what's wrong, uh, what do you expect us to do? Well, I expect you to read my mind. <laughs> right? Absolutely. I'm going to tell you something. So, Lewis, here's what, here's what you have to know. Um, when a woman is mad at you and she doesn't tell you, what she is really saying is, this is your penance. You have to figure out why I am mad and then fix that problem so that I will know that you love me and I will also know that you do not mind that I am crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I also think it might be one of the reasons why we do it is because we really do want to see if you're going to come and try to help us fix it. It's almost like a, a test. It's a really bad thing to do. Better known as a trap. Yeah, our trap. <laughs> yes, exactly. We'll be right back. Stay with us for everybody's final thoughts. Welcome back. Today we spent the entire show talking to men. I have learned so much and I want to give each of my awesome guests one final thing to say. Chuck, you go first. An expression of vulnerability is a show of strength in a relationship. So... Wow. Come on. Uh, you know what? It's time for us as men to break the box. You know, we got to break out of this box of manhood. Let's not lead by dominating. Let's lead by service. Let's lead by love. And let's lead by example. Fabulous. Chris Robbins. I think just to deepen that connection, it's all about sharing yourself and how you truly are feeling. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Tend to your mental health just like you should tend to your physical health. And just as you would hire a trainer if you needed help tending to your physical health, don't be afraid to get help tending to your mental health. I love that. I personally think there's nothing more powerful than a man who has the confidence to be emotionally self-aware, self-expressed, and connected. And it's the greatest gift that you can give to the men and the boys in your life by helping them connect emotionally. And finally, in case nobody else has told you today, let me be the person to tell you that I believe in you and I believe in your ability to change your life for the better. And that's why I'm here cheering for you on the Mel Robbins Show five days a week and reminding you that whatever you're facing, you got this. I'll see you next time. Yeah.